house, and if any Indian tries to stop me, I'll blast him. You know, the only thing more pathetic than Indians on TV is Indians watching Indians on TV. <laughs> Hey, what's going on? It's Ian, back again for another episode of Native Film Talk. I had a great conversation today with Jay Rosenstein, the director of In Whose Honor. It's a little different this time around. Uh, I didn't do another movie. I decided to interview Charlene Teeters and Jay Rosenstein back to back. Uh, I unfortunately, you know, the looking back, I probably could have organized a reunion uh, I, I interviewed these two gosh about four hours apart so um, next time you know if I have the opportunity to bundle these together I'll try to do that but I was thrilled that both of them said yes to agree to talk about the documentary uh, Charlene obviously was the subject of you know the focus of the documentary and, and during her time as a graduate student in 1989 I hope everyone had a chance to listen to that if you haven't Please go back and give that a listen. That's a great uh, companion episode to this one. But you don't necessarily have to. If you've seen In Whose Honor and just want to hear a conversation with the director, this one's for you. He, Jay, really just talks about uh, what it was like to make this, why he decided to make it, and what his experience has been like before and after. And additionally, I found something real interesting is, is he wouldn't make this movie if it were today. He feels like where the climate is with indigenous filmmaking, that it's not his story to tell. He would that at least that's how he would feel right now, which I thought was a powerful thing for him to say. How he arrived at that conclusion, but you know, I I encourage everyone to just give this one a good listen and hear what Jay has to say. And we'll be back to regular your regular programming next week. Um, I'm gonna do Thunderheart. All right, everyone, enjoy. Wonderful. Well, thank you for coming on, Jay. I, I really appreciate uh, really appreciate you making the time. And I, I, I was just saying before that we just had Charlene on, and we were, unfortunately we couldn't get a little mini reunion. But um, <laughs> and I was just saying the power of asking. You just kind of ask and you know see, see what happens. The worst they can say is no. And um, I was astounded that you said yes to come on and uh, discuss your your film in whose honor because. I saw that as a junior in high school. I had a uh, I had a teacher, an English teacher, show me the film, and I, I I grew up on the reservation in Tuba City, Arizona. So I am Navajo, and the entire student body, for the majority of it, was uh, Native American. And okay. we have a stereotypical mascot, at least the image, the the image, the how it's portrayed in the school is very different. We don't go and masquerade and parade it around. Right. Um, but but the but the image itself, the logo, the school logo is very stereotypical. But so at the time, because my school didn't have any negative interactions with mascots, you know, and I was born and raised in that community, everyone else was, we were just like, you know, at least for me, I didn't get it. And I called out the teacher and I'm just like, I don't get what the big deal is. Um <laughs> Until I went to uh, Dartmouth College. That's where I did my undergrad. Oh, okay. Um, and so you mentioned that in your documentary, how, you know, through the time of changing the name, Dartmouth was one of those that changed the name. But, you That's know, right. you know, you know this, every alumni event that where the alumni come back, they, they come back with their legacy regalia, their, their legacy, you know, memorabilia and every, all their letterman jackets and start masquerading around the Dartmouth Indian again. And every homecoming, it surfaces. And that's, Ugh. that's when I finally learned like oh this is a problem uh so you um you went to high school in arizona you said mm -hmm. to be yeah. city, arizona well um i'm glad that uh you know that really it's that charlene's thoughts and ideas and her words we reach, reached you uh because that's the whole point of the film is uh, uh what i was aiming to do was to just be a facilitator and mm -hmm. um, and help Charlene get her word out to more people than she could on her own. Well, and it it really was at the time. I mean, this is pre-internet, you know, and so it's not like and now. Now a hashtag can reach the masses, can can travel right. globally, and it's it's phenomenal to me that Charlene would take a stand at a time where there were only three native students in the entire campus and one of which ended up leaving because of you know and she told me about you know what the art 
teacher or our professor said to her, you know, one little, two little, three little Indians, you know, there's two of you left, you know, are you going to make it, you know, you're not going to make it unless you guys just clam up and don't bring it up. And I think what um, blew my mind is from, from, from a director standpoint is like you put your career, your potential, your career trajectory on you. it, It was jeopardized with this documentary. Can you go and talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure, and you know that really hasn't ended. I'm, I'm oh gosh, I'm currently um, involved in two lawsuits. Um, that uh, one uh, suit filed against me, and then I filed a counter suit. Um, it's not exactly directly related to the documentary, but it is related to my ongoing work uh, in researching and continuing to document this issue at the University of Illinois. But um, mm. Uh, you know, um, what can I say? I mean, well, one spe- of the great, specifically, I was, say, I was the... referring to you being hired on at the university of yeah. Illinois, but you can continue to. Sure. I was going to say one of the great things about youth is naivety. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's really the best way I could describe, you know, myself at the time, partly and partly, um, you know, I felt that my dedication to uh, being a social issue activist was more important than anything else. Mm. Um, And so, you know, I never really had many second thoughts uh, for the most part about doing that film at the time. Uh, But I also never really considered what kind of fallout there would be. But uh, yes, eventually um, I was uh, up for being hired as an assistant professor, and this is in 2000 at the University of Illinois. And what happens in the hiring process is, you know, the department agrees to hire someone and then it has to, you know, the approvals have to go up the chain. And eventually they land at the board of trustees level. Now the University of Illinois is a multiple campus system of which my campus, Champaign-Urbana, is only one of three. So the board of trustees, they don't know who these people are who are being hired. They just it's just a formality that they have to approve them. Well, in my case, um, they recognized my name because of uh, having made in whose honor. And so three of the nine trustees and a student trustee whose vote uh, was just advisory uh, all voted against my being hired. And as far as I know, I think I'm the only uh, faculty member in the history of the University of Illinois to be hired with opposition from members of the Board of Trustees. So I'm very proud of having that <laughs> distinction. <laughs> what What was wild to me is that, uh, I mean, it was the two people that were in the documentary, right? Two of them, yes. Yeah, the, then... the, the, yeah that was that was pretty wild. I, I think that uh, seeing that one, I had never had a negative interaction with uh, native mascots until I went to college. But two, I didn't. I think system. I think living on a reservation, while you there, there are a lot of a litany of things that go along with that that are you're shielded from society in some ways. But I think you're shielded from the systemic racism because you can go to a border town and experience it. You can experience prejudice and actual racism from law enforcement, community members. Um, even then job applications, all, all of that, that whole stuff, but you can go back home and you're kind of back in your Haven. So right. I, when I saw in whose honor, it just didn't register to me the first time that like, it could be that systemic from, it's not just a student run thing. This is like yes. all the way to the board of trustees that they right. were like, no, you will not take our mascot. Right. Um, you know, I, I learned that as well. Um, through the years um, of, you know, meeting Native people, having made this film and talking to Native people over the years. Um, And someone uh, you probably know pretty well, Amanda Blackhorse, who is, uh, you know, also a Navajo and a, you know, great activist, particularly against Mm -hmm. the Washington team for many years. Um, But I remember interviewing her and her making very clear that same kind of story that you're saying, and how unaware she was of you know, what kind, What was going on at these institutions? Because the same thing, she grew up on the reservation and felt very isolated. And it wasn't until she got to, I believe, the University of Kansas mm. that started to understand these issues. What's unfortunate is that on the other side of the issue, the people who work and fight to keep these mascots, 
uh, you know, they have no understanding of, um, you know, how isolated some native people can be in the world that you describe. They just simply assume that everyone, you know, has the same experience as them and understands college sports <laughs> the same way that they do. And um, it's interesting here at Illinois, the way they talk about um, Frank Fool's Crow. Now, Frank Fool's Crow was a uh, as you know, I see you nodding, so you you know who he is. You know, it was a great um, uh, native leader of the Lakota, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, and the, the band director of the University of Illinois sometime in the early 80s went and purchased um, the regalia. an outfit that Frank Fool's Crow had made that the, uh, that the, the mascot here was going to wear. And they even flew him in for a game to present the outfit. And so um, since that day and continuing on today, the people here just consider that an endorsement. Uh -huh. that Frank Fool's Crow has endorsed the mascot and not understanding the fact that, you know, I don't know a lot about Frank Fool's Crow, but I bet he didn't follow college basket, college football and basketball too closely. Um, you know, and subsequently his family asked, a actually asked for the outfit that was purchased from him to be returned. And it did get it did get returned, but you know that part of the story is forgotten. So, you know, people uh, are the, who advocate for the mascots, as you know, are always looking for native people who might might endorse it, and mm -hmm. they can push forward as, oh well, look, you know, this guy. They'd say, oh, well, Ian's Navajo; he doesn't have any problem with it, so it must be okay. And and part of the problem is a lack of understanding of you know, how some people, um, some native people in isolated areas, just what you said, are not aware of how systemic these kind of things are. Well, when I was at, when I was in college, in my undergrad, um, we, we are, you know, home for homecoming in the fall came, and then the legacies came back, and then uh, the Dartmouth Indians started resurfacing, and then we started seeing some shirts being made by some, uh, you know, some student-run publications, and then so we made a big issue out of it. And so that was my first time going through that. But for some of those upperclassmen, this was Groundhog Day for them. It's just like here we go again. You right. know, it's it's homecoming back again. And yes. um, I think that seeing that for the first time where they ask me like non-native people come in like hey ian do you find that offensive you know because right. it's in the paper it's in the review it's in the dartmouth newspaper the main one um and they say like is that offensive to you and it and then i just at first casually answer and then i realize like i'm probably the only native student at dartmouth they're gonna ask that question exactly and, and then so you now you're representing right all native people to mm -hmm. them yeah and so i i think that it, a lot, that gravity started to wear on a lot of people. And Charlene in our interview talked about how she had resorted to really just drinking and being disconnected for a while and just kind of taking a step back of like, I can't do this, but then really just decided to just grab the bull by the horns and say, let's just, let's, let's, let's do it. And then yeah. she, you know, started her healing, started doing better, started, you know, for some reason facing all of that chaos really started that healing process and allowed her to really uh, discover herself and discover her indigeneity and really be an, being an, through being an advocate. And I think that I never got there because I just never felt felt like my footing was there yeah, because of right. my history. And I just never found that until now. Um I saw your documentary. I rented it last year again. And I'm just like, yeah, let me, I, I haven't seen this since, you know, uh -huh. uh, high school. So I was a junior high school. I'll watch it again. Completely different film. Completely oh, really? from, the, yeah, I, I saw it again after my experience in college. And I'm just like, wow, what the heck was I thinking the first uh -huh. time I saw it? Because it was powerful. You did I an think, amazing work. Well, thank you, Ian. Um, I think one of the things that has maybe surprised me the most about the film is when I made the film, you know, my intended audience or the audience that I was hoping to reach uh, was essentially non-native people, um, or, you know, you could even narrow it down to probably mostly white people mm -hmm. who, um, who either were in favor of these mascots or in particular who had never heard, even heard of this controversy before, which meant that they would be open to hearing, you know, information rather than being closed off. But what surprised me the most and still does is the, um, the degree to which the film has helped to educate native people. 
it, that never occurred to me that that would actually be a big audience for the film. Mm. And that's something that I've, you know, learned along the way. And I've heard, you know, quite a few other stories just like yours over the, you know, how long has it been? Now I have to add it up. 23 years? <laughs> 97, yeah, 23 years. <laughs> since the film was uh, was released is, you know, again, is, is how frequently it's been used to educate Native people, which um, is, is just uh, wonderful. It makes me feel fa fantastic. Not only that, that it could help that way, but that I could accomplish something like that, that as someone who grew up, you know, in all white communities, going to an all white high school, uh, coming to college at a college, which is, you know, overwhelmingly white. And, you know, I never even met a Native American person, um, you know, until I was uh, in my mid 20s. Wow. I, I never that I even knew of, you know, so I was as ignorant about Native people as you know, the, what I assumed that people in the audience for the film were as well. Hmm. Um, Charlene was actually one of the first Native people I ever heard speak in person. Um, and that's, you know, what grabbed me the first time I heard her speak was what started the whole process for me of thinking, wow, the stuff she's saying is incredible. Everybody needs to hear this. That mm -hmm. that was my reaction. But I can remember hearing her speak on a panel with two or three other Native people and and literally looking at at her and thinking, oh, so this is what a Native American woman looks like, mm -hmm. you know, because, it, you know, Native people were just, um, you know, I was I was so isolated from any Native people that I could look at Charlene and, and have to think about, OK, well, she kind of looks like, you know, the Pocahontas cartoon, which was my only reference. Right, right. But yeah, OK, I could see some similarities there. But, you know, I was already in my mid-20s mm -hmm. and, and I'm actually seeing a Native person face to face for the first time in my That's life. wild. Yeah. You know, I uh, I review. So uh, I can give you a quick rundown of the podcast. So I I review one film per episode and I try to uh, look at look at the representation and I try to reflect on when I first saw the movie and then what it is now. Um, I was a Native American studies major at Dartmouth uh -huh. and every chance I got, I tried to weave in film because I took a native film studies course. There was only oh, one great. course offered at one time and uh, NAS 28. I'll never forget that taught by Mishana Goman. And, uh, it was a wonderful course that just opened my eyes to, you know, all the tropes, the recurring tropes in film and media, sure. you know, the carnivalesque, the white savior, all of these things. And I was just like, my eyes were open. So I watching uh indian in the cupboard over again i don't know if you've ever seen the film or or read the book but no but uh, I, i'm familiar with the name yeah, yeah and so at, the, the the individual in that is uh on a daga and they kind of have this vanishing indian kind of a uh, really trope in there to where in the end of the movie uh, little bear who's the who's the native person played by lightfoot he says you know he's supposed to supposedly from the past and he says you know what, what's the future like for my people it's like it's not good and um it's just like you're kind of you're, you're 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 always a great people but you're not always here kind of thing yeah right. and so me being a navajo kid i thought onondaga were gone and so it's funny you say that's that you, yeah. you 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 have your like oh that's a real that's a real native woman that's a real right. native what like when i went to college i met someone who is onondaga i'm like oh my god they're real <laughs> like i was just like oh my gosh you know, and I, I joke around with that with some of my friends who are from the Six Nations. And I'm just like, I no joke thought you guys were gone because of what we saw on television, you know, because everything was always from back then. Sure. It was never present. And sure. I think that in representation in uh, film and media, I think that it's it's so important to have this conversation while people will be like, Ian, this is native film talk. What, this is sports mascots. What are you having, you know, talking about in whose honor before? But, you know, uh, representation of mascots and how they're represented in film and media, they're, they're one and the same. Sure. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I would guess that more people have more interactions with mascots and logos than they even do about um, than representations in other kind of media, mm -hmm. you know, because professional sports are so, so popular, you know, and so ubiquitous throughout uh, the country. And that's, of course, why these last, um, these two major professional changes, which are um, almost 
I wasn't sure I'd ever see them happen in my lifetime with the Washington team changing their name. And then just this past week, yeah, Cleveland. a Cleveland baseball team saying, okay, we're not going to call ourselves the Indians anymore. Um, you know, those, those are some pretty, pretty major hurdles that have, that have, um, or I should say, you know, major, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought, okay. but you know what I'm saying there, major, does... uh, major changes and, and then, of course, we can go back and, you know, you can draw a line connecting, you know, Charlene's work beginning in the, you know, the late or the early 1990s to that and 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 all and connect all the dots of all the people um, that made that happen. You know, Charlene's activism goes without saying is is unparalleled. And she definitely did start a tidal wave or was a key component in continuing that fight. But your documentary reached a lot of people, native and non-native alike. So how, how does it feel knowing you had a hand in changing the name and seeing the Redskins topple, seeing the Indians topple, seeing the Illinois topple? How does that feel? Well, I would say that it's probably the signature or greatest accomplishment of my life. And you're Outside. a Peabody winner. <laughs> but not for that. Not for that yeah. film, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the greatest accomplishment outside of my two children, I have to kind of say that. But, um, you know, I, I am I. I'm trying to think of the words that I can say. Um, I feel so grateful and lucky and humbled and happy that I could participate or be, you know, just I, I always thought of what I was doing as a link in a chain, mm. that what I was trying to do is just link up this thing to the next thing. You know, I never thought that my one thing that I was doing in and of itself was ever going to make a difference. But um, I am extremely, extremely proud and humbled to have played a small role in the legacy of getting rid of so many of these mascots and nicknames simply because I very early on was able to understand what the problem with them was. And the reason I was able to understand that was by meeting Charlene Teeters mm -hmm. and listening to her. And, and that was my education. And again, when I first made In Whose Honor, I, I had two things in mind. One was, you know, I would just like to help Charlene get her message out or let more people hear her than she could physically get access to. That was it. And there were a lot of long, <laughs> dark nights in the edit room wondering if I could ever manage to pull this thing together where I had to keep reminding myself, OK, Jay, you know, don't overcomplicate this. You just let Charlene speak and just get it out, you know, stay out of the way. Just let it get out there. Um, and then the other thing that that I thought of when I was first making the film was that the film could be a tool, a very useful tool that the activists who were currently working on the mascot issue could use. And as they went around the country, uh, and you know, we also have to, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge people like Suzanne Harjo, who's you know, been one of the great leaders of, of the movement, as I'm sure you know, um, in parallel with Charlene, or even probably might have started before her. I, I'm not exactly sure, but she's one of the prime movers as well. Um, and just thinking, okay, there's these activists, you know, going around Vernon Bellacourt, some of whom I met, Michael Haney, who are in the film, um, Red Crow, Floyd Red Crow Westerman. And mm -hmm. as they went around the country and, you know, held small meetings and, and such, and were trying to educate people on the issue, that I'd give them this thing. And it's a tool that they could use, and then they could leave it with the group as they left town. Um, so I never really thought of it as being anything more than that, just a tool to help these activists. Um, it was beyond the scope of my imagination that eventually millions and millions of people could see it and it would impact people and it would continue to impact people 23 years later. Yeah. I mean, that's something I can never get my head around. But, you know, I've said that um, in a way, this, um, this, this film is sort of my epitaph, you know, mm. of my life. And I'm okay with that. Like I, I, I'm proud of that and I'm, I'm settled in the fact that I'll probably never in my life do anything more significant or influential than that. And I'm okay with that. 
Like if that's it, then I'm good with that. I'm I'm proud to have that. Well, I think you're I think you're <laughs> selling yourself short there. What 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 you did? It's it's not like uh, you know you're selling you know lemonade at a lemonade stand. You're you're <laughs> toppling giants with this. You know, I mean, you along with other people's efforts. A lot of a lot of other people. Yeah, you know. and it's yeah. uh, but but this this movie. I mean, one it it gets people like me who are native to really evaluate their own situation, um, even if it does take years. I think what me and Charlene discussed is sometimes you just, it just sits with you. And it's like, mm-hmm. it's like if everyone's incubation period is different for them to finally have their awakening, mm-hmm. but that's, eventually, that's eventually we do. And your film does that for us. And some people they're still incubating, but eventually it'll, it'll happen for them because someone close to them or someone they know, or they might see an interview like Charlene's when you right. see visibly, you're just like, that's a native sister of ours like being ripped apart by their experience from this school's portrayal of native people. Maybe there is something wrong with that. Hey, that's pretty close to what my school does or what my kid's school that they play does. And I think that what you did in the documentary was took it out of the scope of just the school and showed how schools that have no native representation at all in their school can take a life of their own. Right. You go, you go and play teams in your conference and they, they, they bastardize the the mascot. They turn it into their own thing. It's no longer the honoring portion that the school, you know, tried to hang their hat on that goes out the window because that school just turned it it, at that point. It's just a sports, you know, uh, icon that they can just cartoonize and, you know, bastardize. That's right. And then, you know, I also had my own incubation period too, you have to remember, because, you know, I, again, I grew up in a society where my only uh, sort of access to anything about Native people were mascots and, you know, cartoons and, you know, whatever, however they were on TV shows and nothing else, no real people. And then I came to the University of Illinois as an undergrad um, in 1978, and I was a big, big sports fan, you know, so Mm -hmm. I had season tickets to football and basketball. And, you know, I saw that chief dance and I I just, I thought nothing of it. It just seemed like a normal thing to me. Like, oh yeah, there's the cheerleaders and oh, okay, they've got a guy who dresses up like an Indian and he danced around. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I guess I was never one of those people who it became some sort of like religious icon to me, the way people talk about it now. To me, it was just, there's the cheerleaders and there's this, okay. But I I could never um, imagine that there could ever be anything wrong with it because it was normal. But, you know, I do want to mention that one of the ways in which one of the things that changed me personally was hearing Charlene and then seeing in, you know, the student newspaper, some of the cartoons and things that were that were done, you know, about the mascot and and then, you know, seeing them with with a different point of view, seeing them through Mm -hmm. new eyes. And what immediately struck me was that I connected those caricatures and cartoons to the cartoons that I had seen drawn of Jewish people, which is what Mm. I am, a Jewish person, by the Nazis as a way of turning the entire population to hate Jews. They used those same kind of cartoons and, and characterizations to turn a population against Jews. And it was so obvious to me how those two things were the same. And that was, you know, for me, that's the moment where I said, oh, I totally get this now. Now I yeah, totally if, understand. If you were to juxtapose them, you know, yeah, then you, you see it clear as day. Yes. I think the, uh, there was an image of, I can't remember, they had, you know, they, they made a fake one for, you know, uh, African Americans, white people, Asian Americans. Oh, yeah. And oh, then yeah. it's like, had, and then they show the Cleveland Indians at the bottom. It's like, how do you sure. think that makes natives feel? And I think, unfortunately, it takes something that visual for people to see it. Um, it has to be that painfully obvious of like, oh, wow, this really is a problem. And it takes you to re to take someone to redo the image. I'm sure you've seen it where they put the Caucasians oh, instead yeah. of the Cleveland Indians, and then they redo it with a money sign instead of a feather. And, yeah, you know, and, absolutely. and uh, it needs to almost, it's frustrating that it has to get to that point, but um, I, I wanted to ask you as a, as a filmmaker, well, what, what, it, what will it, what will it take for the film industry to start to trust native people with their own story and their own experience to be either behind the camera or in charge of the story? Because we have a long history of misrepresenting in, in, in sports, but also in the film industry as a whole. 
I think, you know, you've hit on a, a subject that um, is, is a real dilemma that I have and I think most people in, certainly in the documentary industry, and I'm not in any industry, I should say, but in the documentary world, that's pro the major problem that everyone's grappling with now. And my wife is also a documentary filmmaker and also an educator, wow. and, and we discuss this a lot. And when I first made In Whose Honor, um, it, then it started being shown in some of the native film festivals. And so I, I went, you know, I'd go really? to those festivals, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and I, I, I attended some of them. And the, um, the message that was always in those festivals was the one that you just said, which is like, okay, as native people, we need to start taking control of our own images and we need to start making the films. And I would sit there and think, uh Oh, do I belong here? Like, am I, I'm not a native person. I made this film. So am I part of the problem? Hmm. Uh, and uh, you know, the way I, I sort of negotiated that in my own mind was by saying, well, look, I didn't make a film for native people. I'm, I'm making a film for my community. If you consider white people, you know, my community. So, <laughs> right, so right. well, look, I was making it for me. And I never had any native filmmaker or anyone in that context ever criticize me for saying, oh, you're appropriating our, our stories or our images. But at the same time, I felt, yeah, I kind of did that. So is it okay or not? And, you know, talking about it now, Ian, if, if I was thinking about making that film today, I wouldn't do it. Really? Yeah, I would say, no, uh, this has to be done by a native filmmaker. Hmm. I can't be the one to do it. So I still don't know what the answer to that is. You know, like, absolutely, it's true that, you know, we need more native filmmakers and there are more. And, you know, um, through this this uh, um, native distribution company that I'm a member of, New Day Films, there have been a number of native filmmakers that have come through, um, Dan Golding in particular, who's a good friend of mine native filmmaker and, and et cetera. But, you know, today I'm, I'm not sure, like, is, is it okay for me to make a film about another community that I'm not a member of? Mm. And I don't know the answer to that, but I would say that today I wouldn't do it. I would, I, I, would... I certainly think there's instances where it's done right. I, I, I think native people have a, uh, they probably have their 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 sights calibrated a little bit better when they you know make a documentary or a film about their own people. But still, because there are over five hundred Native nations, a Navajo guy can completely miss the miss the mark <laughs> right. making a movie about you know Lakota people. Exactly, and exactly. vice versa. So I don't necessarily think you have to be from that community to uh, to get it right. I, I watched a documentary recently because I'm going to do Thunderheart soon. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Incident at Oglala. I don't know if you've seen that documentary of course, before. Michael Apted, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. And so that's an example of like, hey, he he got the movie right because it was based on real events. You know, I mean, you say what you want about Val Kilmer's role and you know that that whole thing. I'll, you 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 strip away Val Kilmer, it's a it's a damn near perfect movie because it's real. You yeah. know, it's 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 a real story. It really happened. Yeah. I think if you're telling the truth, it doesn't really matter where you come from or what your experiences are because. Michael Apted listened to them tell their story and did exactly what you did and said, Hey, I'm going to tell their story, give them a platform, give them uh, an opportunity really for non-native people to see what the hell is really going on over there. Yeah. I think, you know, I think that's the key and I hope that I did this correctly. Oh, you did. Okay. Jeez, well, thank you. You, uh, you know, it means a lot to me to hear native people tell me you did that correctly, but you know, it, it has to do with, you, you know, you have to approach the subject with, first of all, a huge amount of humility and mm -hmm. not be arrogant at all and approach it and say, look, this is not me. I don't have this background. I have no way of understanding what Native people like yourself have gone through in their lives. So all I can do is listen and let them use their own words in their own words to tell the story. And so I tried to be enormously careful about my never saying anything mm -hmm. that that characterized what a native person would say. I only had one line in the whole film where I did that. And I went and I asked Charlene, is it okay if I say this? I like I got her permission. 
It's the only place in the narration where I felt really? like I was speaking for a native person. There's one line. And I asked her and she said, it's fine. And what um, line was that? It was where I said she was, um, <laughs> I used to be able to say the film. Oh, line I'm sure. Line. It's, yeah. it's where I say something like she was raised near a reservation in Spokane and learned about native dance or something like that, where I was, I was characterizing something about her. I was saying something about her that she, instead of her saying it. And so I had to, I made sure to ask her, you know, is this okay for me to say that? I see. No, it was, uh, and I think you, you having that, uh, really regard for just somebody's perspective, removing our culture, uh, a culture aside, I think you just, you, you assumed you didn't know because you don't know just right, like exactly. how, just, just like how I would never assume anything for, for about Jewish culture. Right. You no, know, I, I would, I would check with you like, Jay, does this, does this sound right? You know, I wouldn't and, just push it out in the ether and be like, ah, close enough. But, and like you, Ian, I would be like, well, here's what I think, but there's um, t 2 million other Jews mm. that might answer that question differently. So I also can't be the spokesperson. Right? And see, and that's why I, um, I, I try not to be too hard on people that, that say like, you should never ask someone to be a spokesperson for their race. It's just like, it's easy for me to say that because I've experienced that, but I do that. I, I would have done that to you. Like, Hey, as a Jewish person, what does that sound like to you? I would have right. never thought that it's the exact same thing that I'm asking you to be a representative of your entire race, yeah. but that, but that happens. And I think that having this, well, one, I think just having serious conversations like this where you're willing to, willing to fail in a conversation of just like, Oh, sure. whoops, I said that wrong, but you know, I'm glad you thank you for the correction. Sure. Um, I, I will say your documentary, watching it again, I'm, I, I took some uh, screenshots of the stills. I appreciate that you've updated it. So if you, if, it, if anyone listening, you can go watch in whose honor Jay goes and updates uh, really some like current with current events on what yeah, happened. The text at the end. Yeah. Oh I yeah. Periodically update it. Yeah. That was great. That was Thanks. great information because one, I, I did all that before I watched it and I'm like, darn it, I could have just watched this thing. <laughs> it's got all the information on here. Well, um, I guess I wanted to, wanted your opinion. Oh, wait, you just brought something up. Now I need to update it again because of Washington football mm -hmm. team. And go, like, uh, you just reminded me, I've got some work to do. <laughs> it's a, it's a wonderful documentary. And Thank I think you. that um, it's frustrating that well one it's 48 minutes great runtime by the way you can you can you can watch that during dinner <laughs> actually um, I, I i now have a 32 minute version too no that, kidding yeah so that i um that could uh that length i think is even more helpful in a classroom situation where oh could, that's great especially like a high school where classes are like an hour long it would you know so yeah i i, I trimmed it down as much as i could without losing you know the essence of what it's about I, th I think that uh, in the, I think that's wonderful. That's, that's awesome. You're still wanting to make it more palatable for everybody. That's, that's amazing. Um, I think that the NCAA ruling that came out of like leaving it up to the regional, you know, tribe, the falling on like the tribal sovereignty. Um, I thought that was such a cop out from the NCAA because it goes back to what you're saying. You're asking that native nation to be the representative yes. of all native people. Yes. And, there's people that have heartburn with the fact that the Seminoles are okay with it, you know, right. because it's, uh, you know, and the, the same with, I'm sure with the Blackhawks, if it ever gets there with the uh, Chicago NHL and. Well, Blackhawks are doing the exact same thing. They, they, in fact, there was just a story that came out in about them uh, in the Chicago media, because, you know, they go back to the Blackhawks and say, well, now with the Cleveland Indians, well, what do you say? And their answer is, we work very closely with Chicago area natives. Of course. And so as long as the Chicago area natives, you know, are okay, then we're okay. Again, just mm -hmm. like you say, without realizing this gets out to the rest of the world. And, right. that, and, and then again, who are those small, you know, even within Chicago natives, there's controversy because there are some who think it's okay and there are some yeah. who don't. Um, but it's the same thing you're talking about that you say, okay, well, if I can just get my little group to, to, you know, work with me in some way, then it's going to be okay for everyone else. But, you know, I think at this point now, the, the writing is really on the wall. And right. I think the Blackhawks, Chicago Blackhawks, were sort of one of the last teams to get identified as being problematic. So they're having to go through the process, 
Like they're mm. they're at step two, <laughs> whereas <laughs> like Washington and Cleveland were already at step ten, and so Chicago still has to filter through all those steps. I think before they'll get to that point. But yeah, um, well, and then it's the got to writing's st- on the wall now. And then it's got to go to the high schools after that because that's frankly I oh, I, I, I read well, is, I read one of the know, articles yeah. that were on your uh, in Who's on Honor website. And saying that I think 95% of all native representation lies at the high school ranks. Well, you know, and it, that, that blew my mind and it made complete sense once, as yeah. soon as I read it, but I'm just like, my gosh, like we got so much more work to do. But if you, if you go on the website and for people who are interested, it's, it's in whose you know, written out, but I do, uh, I have tried to keep a running list of all schools or organizations that have had native representation that have gotten rid of it. And, um, and my list is pretty comprehensive. And when you look at it, you, you can actually see the way in which, um, you know, the, the whole message and the movement has been gaining, gaining energy and mm-hmm. accelerating. And so, for instance, since Washington team announced theirs, there have been approximately maybe 30 different high schools around the country that have now done that and so in other words i think this year they'll probably be the greatest number of schools getting rid of mascots than any other year before so wow. you know the, the the momentum is building and it's it's almost now it's almost impossible for a high school that has the nickname either redskins now or indians to be able to justify it anymore mm-hmm. since the professional team get, got rid of it you know that 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 kind of ends their ability to justify it. So, you know, it's like, you know, the snowball thing, it's building and it's great. But if you look at the list that I have on my website, it's kind of mind boggling when you see how long that list is, you're going, wow, like that's a lot of schools, even though it's only a small fraction of what's out there. But um, each time one school does it, it gives more ammunition to the next school to look at it and go, well, wait, look at all these schools that have already done it. It's not just us. Because in so many of these instances, uh, it, you know, you're talking about a lot of high schools in very in areas where there are very few Native people. And it might be that just one kid or one family comes out against the school mascot and then they get attacked by, mm-hmm. you know, the entire uh, alumni base of that school, et cetera, et cetera. And they're, they're so outnumbered and they're so isolated that they really get beat up. But now... You, you know, you can look at this long list of other schools that have done and say, well, wait a minute, it's not just me. Look at what happened here in Connecticut and look at all these schools in Massachusetts and look at, and look at the state of Maine. The entire state said no more mascots in our state whatsoever. And there's a couple other bills and legislatures doing that, too. So, you know, that also helps where there are, are small numbers of, of Native people trying to fight this, that they can look at the, the wider scope and say, well, look what happened with the Washington football team. Um, and so... It, you know, it's always a question, I think, of getting to that critical mass. And I'm hopeful that we've kind of hit that critical mass now. I, I, I sure as hell hope so, because we kind of get, I mean, every generation always thinks that their generation is better than the previous, obviously. And so I it, it was amazing to me that they didn't say, they weren't saying liberal snowflake in the 1997 documentary, but it was the same language, just different word choice. You know, it was just like, oh, people just got to suck it up, you know? And then now you get the, well, I, w- if we weren't in the everybody gets a medal participation trophy <laughs> era, then this wasn't, you know, when I was a kid, this wasn't a problem. Right. I really don't like the, how it gets kind of jumbled into all of that. When the truth is, this has been an issue forever. It's just, it hasn't been, uh, really light hasn't been shed on on it to this degree and in 1997 i'm sure people were saying the same thing and prior to that who knows how much longer people were fighting the issue but just it hadn't been brought to the stage where people could see it yeah and and you're right when when i read articles about you know these when these debates come up in various places in the country with high schools all of the the language used is exactly the same the mm-hmm. exact same language is used everywhere to defend their mascot identical um and and they all think that they're different no well, yeah, that's yeah. A problem, but ours is different but it's it's everybody says it's the same same stuff and i will tell mm-hmm. you this um i am so glad that the film came out before social media mm-hmm. and all that other stuff because um you know even today the the kind of I never experienced the kind of hatred 
that I experienced today about that issue on social media. So I'm glad that I got to, you know, the, the film out for several decades before social media became what it is today. It's amazing. It's amazing. I'm stunned by the, the hatred that's, that's thrown at me personally just over this issue. Uh, anyways, I, you know, I shouldn't be stunned because it happens in, in every quarter. But, you know, I, maybe if it was that way 20 years ago, I might have been afraid to put out the film, maybe. Um, you know, but at that time, you know, uh, any negative stuff I got were letters, you know, so someone had to sit down with a pen and write <laughs> it down and put a stamp on it, you know, so that slows it down quite a bit. And I did get some letters and I did get some emails, but in 1997, email wasn't even as ubiquitous as, as mm -hmm. it is right now. So, you know, the, the backlash that I felt was pretty minimal compared to the backlash I feel and get thrown at me today, 23 years later. It it blows my mind. I, you know, you can YouTube Chief Alianowick dance, and there are people that have recorded and posted his last dance of you know ESPN right. coverage uh, for the football game and basketball game. It blew my mind. I mean, they, they, this is probably I don't know seven eight years ago now, and um, at least the video that's how old it was, and people had overwhelming support still were just like oh, yeah. bring chief back oh yeah you know oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I wish we could go back to those days i played in the band in 2010 i wish i was you know a student 10 years earlier you know oh it gives me chills seeing the chief go back and up and down the court i don't see the big issue i'm just like geez he, they will not let it go you yeah. know and um it makes me it makes me like con concerned because it's just like it makes me wonder, like, what movies and television were they raised on? You know, what, what what were those conversations like in their home? What experiences do they have with native people? And it probably is just what you said, film and television, and 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 the mascot. And um, there's a movie, there's a documentary I'm sure you've seen by Neil Diamond, Real Engine. Um, oh yeah, that that changed my life when I saw yeah. that documentary. Um, no joke changed my life is the whole reason why this podcast is even in existence because I saw yeah. somebody who was Cree from Canada and still thought he was a lame Indian because he didn't have a war bonnet, didn't ride horses, he didn't have yeah. war paint. And right. that's how I felt growing up. I'm just like, Mom, Navajos suck. Like, we don't have a whole, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, right. No, why are we cool like that? You yeah, know? yeah, right. yeah. Because the, the cool Indians, quote unquote, you yeah. know, they, they did all the stuff that are, are more like in the plains, more in the North, South Dakota, Idaho, Montana area, more traditional to that region. And we never did right. any of that, you know? Right. Like, it's just, it, it's crazy that movies can give you, as an indigenous person, a complex because you're not represented. So you glom onto anything you possibly can. Yeah. And then, so seeing movies like yours, it's uh, it's encouraging. My and I uh, think I think a lot of white people again don't understand that those kind of things impact native people growing up as well. Like what you're talking about, there's just an assumption, you know, that oh well, native people they they should already understand all this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember just when my kids were growing up here. Um, Robert Warrior, who's a professor now at uh, University of Kansas, but at the time he's a friend of mine, and he was a professor at University of Illinois and living in my neighborhood, you know, and so of course my kids go to elementary school and they get exposed to, you know, the same crap, you know, it's okay, Thanksgiving, there's the friendly Indians and blah, 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 you know, and, and, and fortunately, you know, my kids were about the same age as Robert's kids and we used to see each other at the park and, and all that. And so I, I, I had that at least as a reference to help them. I'd say, okay, you know how they talk about Indians in school? like that they live in teepees. Well, you know, you know, Robert Warrior and his kids, where do they live? Well, they live in a house just like ours. What do they look like? How do they dress? Does he wear, mm -hmm. you know, feathers? No, he dresses like, you know, so I, I was I was fortunate even just to have that, to have a native person in proximity in my neighborhood, you know, that I could use to, and, and of course they got it right away. I'm like, well, that's how Indians might have been hundreds of years ago, but you know, today they're doctors and they're lawyers. And you know, again, look at, he lives in a house in our neighborhood, same thing. Um, and just having at least that small amount of proximity 
was helpful. Of course, my kids were going to get it no matter what because mm-hmm. I was going to bash them over the head until they did. <laughs> but you know, I'm just saying, like having that, like being able to go to the park. You know, you know, you know, Robert. You know his kids. How is he different than us? He's not exactly. He's not. I think uh, Charlene so eloquently. I wish I could play record it for and play it for you, but um, um, in in Indian country. I, when I first started bringing this issue, I had a former podcast years ago that, you know, fell flat in its face. I just lost momentum. But one of my key focuses was mascots. Mm -hmm. And whenever I would bring that up to a native person, you know, back home, especially back home on the res, they were just like, let's triage all of our problems out of everything we got going on, land rights, water rights, food insecurity, native mascots is all the way at the bottom. That's where you want to spend your time and energy. And I, that was always, you know, uh, that was always checkmate for me. I'm like, you got me there. I guess I really am. My heart's in the wrong place. I think I should redirect my efforts. And Charlene so eloquently said that, well, all of those are connected. The reason why those first issues that you mentioned, when you triage, like you, when you dehumanize a people that allows you to take their land, to take their water, right. to have them, uh, you know, suffer through food right. insecurity no and institutional right. racism. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, subjugate them to subpar health care and give sure. them all these, but call it free. So therefore it's, it's, it's superior right. and, uh, and pass it all off as like, Hey, we're helping you. And it allows all that to happen. So, I mean, they're all interconnected. And so I think that someday I hope that that's what native people and non-native people see it's just like it's not just a mascot it's not just an image like some it it took me gosh several years to come to terms with all that and uh everyone like i said has their own incubation period and it's so refreshing to see people like you like filmmakers like you that see the problem for what it is and you're like you know what more people need to hear this because i think that's what's the most important thing um especially when it comes to native storytelling well, uh, Charlene is masterful at, at doing that, at educating people about that. And, and I wouldn't even dare to attempt to, you know, to, to go into that area because she's so great at it. But, you know, I also look at the moment, the, the moment or the day that I met Charlene Teeters was absolutely life changing for me. Mm. And I can look at sort of the trajectory of my life absolutely changed from the moment I, 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 not even meeting her, from the first moment I heard her speak, you know, I didn't actually meet her till uh, many, many years later. But, um, you know, she personally has impacted my life in in so many profound ways. Um, You know, it goes without saying I love the woman and I, I cherish the friendship I have with her and the relationship I have with her. And I have learned so much from her as well, uh, which again goes really speaks to, um, I was going to say her power, maybe power isn't the right word, Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, that I've, I've learned so much from her, even though I'm not a native person, not only about her, your, her and your cultures, but being around Char, like after the film came out, we, we did a bunch of um, speaking engagements together, you know, at various places. And, mm-hmm. and I really cherish the time that we spent together uh, doing those things because um, <laughs> what some people don't realize is, you know, when, when you, you get to know her in a sort of more personal way, she's one of the funniest people <laughs> in the world. And when I think about the times we spent together, all I can think about is just laughing constantly, just being cracked up. Mm-hmm. from beginning to end but she helped me to understand and embrace my own culture wow. from being with her i learned better how to um, understand and place myself as a jewish person in this world and you wouldn't think that like how could some indian woman have taught me that mm-hmm. but i really did i learned that from her by learning from her about you know, about Indian culture and all the things that she spoke about it, it resonated to me and moved me to where I got an education about being Jewish from this woman talking about what it's like to be a native person. I think that uh, people like that, like Charlene and, you know, prominent speakers like Vindaloria, John Trudell. John Trudell has a great quote, you know, we're not Indians and we're not 
Native Americans were older than both those concepts were the people or the human beings. He has so many great quotes oh, yeah. like that. And, and Charlene's the same way. You know, you surround yourself with great people and you start to become them. And you can tell that being surrounded by those AIM leaders and, um, you know, those activists, they really framed her mindset and helped her really become such an eloquent speaker. And I, she is, yeah. man, it was, uh, it was powerful, you know, to, to, to talk to her and really, and, and to hear her side of it, of just like, every, it's okay to not get it because she didn't get it, you know, at first. Yeah. But for me, I'm like, Charlene Teeters never got it at one point. That's not, she was always this finished product, you <laughs> right, know, because right. that's how she comes across on, she on does. the screen. She and, does. Um, She's an amazing person. And, and I feel very blessed in my life to have gotten to know her. And again, to be able to count her as, as a, a dear friend. And, you know, if you want to talk about the film, had I not made that film, for instance, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Right. Mm -mm. And, I probably would have gone through my whole life, maybe never knowing a native person personally or having a personal wow. friendship or relationship. And now I look at how my life has been so enriched by all the relationships I've had with so many native people over the years. And, and you're the next one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I can say, yeah, I met this guy, Ian. He's, he's a brilliant guy. He went to Dartmouth, you know, and so none of this would have happened to me had I not made the film. So that's sort of, partly my reward one of my rewards of making the film is that I've, I've gotten to meet this all these incredible people from a culture that i would probably have never had any interaction with before it's phenomenal you did you did a great service to indian country with your documentary thank you. so thank you for that um i guess just one last thing i just this is more of just a curious curiosity question do you have any favorite like native films or films about natives or natives that are represented? You know, nobody's ever asked me that, so you really caught me off guard. Um, you know, I'm just trying to think. And no pressure. I'm... If you say Pocahontas, I won't hate you. <laughs> no, no, it's not Pocahontas. Uh, Long before Pocahontas came on, came about, I, I knew Charlene, and so I knew that there was going to be problems <laughs> coming. Um, you know, I'm just I'm trying to rack my brain about just what films I've even seen um, you know, and obviously one of the first was probably Incident at Oglala. I mean, I remember going to the theater oh, wow. when, there, when there were theaters <laughs> and seeing that film in a theater. Um, and of course, you know, I saw Thunderheart on TV. I, I, I'm just trying to think of um, what I've seen and what I, how I could rank them. And, no, it's okay. Uh, if I'm there's sorry, a... you've, you've actually caught me off guard. Um, I do have a, a, a friend named Jim Jim Fortier, who's a, a native filmmaker from um, San Francisco area. And uh, he made a really good documentary about uh, the, the Alcatraz, taking over Alcatraz, called We Hold the Rock. Hmm. And I think um, that's, that's one documentary that I, I've shown in class and I know sticks out, but... You've really caught me off guard here. I'm gonna have no. That's to... good. I have a list. Sorry, I don't of... have a good answer for you right off. The it's top okay. Of my head. I have a I have a list of about 100 and I want to say 70 movies that are on the <laughs> list. And Actually, uh... going back a number of years, this is going way back to the late 90s. I think there was a this filmmaker, this woman. I forget her name, um, but I'd had some. She made a film about. Uh, the fishing rights um, controversies going on up in northern Wisconsin uh, in Lac de Flambeau. And I think it was called Lighting the Seventh Fire. But this, this, is, oh. this is now an old, old film. But it really resonated with me because I had visited the, that reservation in that area um, before I made In Whose Honor. That was really like the first time I got to know some Native people. And I knew a lot of the people who were in that film. Um, some no of kidding. I, yeah, some of whom I'm still friends with today through social media. Uh, <laughs> and, and that film really, really, uh, I responded very strongly with that. I, I imagine if you watch it today, it has a sort of primitive look production wise as In Whose Honor does too because of the time. But um, that was a really great film, but also because it was made about a, a, an area that I knew well and I, I knew the people I knew, you know, I knew what was going on up there. Um, 
So those are a few that that come to mind right now. But I'm sorry, I don't have. No, it's okay. I I I even came up with that on the spot. So uh, I it was always, it was always my uh, really goal to ask guests about that. You're only my second if, guest ever. So I if will... I find things, I'll, I'll send you an email. Uh, so you got to check this one out. Add this one to your list. But um, for sure, there's uh, I'm sure there's lots and lots and lots of well two 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 there. recent ones that i can't shut up about i mean obviously smoke signals but but uh oh yeah i saw that's, smoke signals, that's like right. the goat but I forgot, right i forgot about that because when i was doing festivals um that was around the time that came out too so it was being shown at a lot of the festivals that in whose honor was in and i got to um uh i got to meet uh chris Hare. i didn't i never met chris Hare actually but i did meet um two of the actors in the film the guy with the glasses <laughs> oh uh dr evan tom um evan yeah, adams yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and then um the young woman uh irene bedard yes thank mm -hmm. you uh, at my age i can't remember names it's okay <laughs> but i i was sort of starstruck to meet even meet them at the time I was that's amazing nervous. i was kind of nervous and <laughs> excited to get to meet them <laughs> there were two films that i reviewed recently one was indian horse um that was a fantastic one that's on netflix right now Highly recommend that. Great. Uh, it's it's not a true story, but it's all based on true events. It's a fictional tale, and it's based on a book written by Richard Wagamese. And my gosh, if you want to see, that is like the most accurate depiction of residential boarding schools I've ever seen oh, on yeah. camera. And uh, it's gut wrenching, but it's such a it's it's much like yours. I'm sure years down the road, you'll look at that film and be like, man, I'm so glad they made that. You know, it just just to get it out there, to get that story out there for people to see. Um, 100 percent don't think it's for native people because of the pain it kind of recalls for because uh, that's like your your grandparents, your mother, your dad, yeah, right. you know, your uh, your aunts and uncles that you remember because um, they all went to boarding school or a lot of them did. Um, so Indian Horse, great. And then uh, Blood Quantum. It's a film mm. by Jeff Barnaby. It's a horror film. It's just a zombie thrasher but it has such an interesting premise and it's uh, run by natives hundred percent like native acted um, like the only not people that are zombies are white people. And so it's a very interesting uh, new, a new right, a fiction film. Not a it's a very film. interesting one. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, I, I, I thank you so much for, for, for taking the time uh, Jay. And I, once again, I just, you know, Wayne's world, you know, I'm not worthy, you know, we're not worthy because this you're is too really... young to you're too young to be making <laughs> Wayne's World references, but thank you. You're uh, again. It, it's been a real pleasure to speak with you and get to know you. And uh, again, I can't tell you how heartwarming it is for me to hear that my work had some positive influence on you. That's just the most humbling thing and the the greatest compliment that I could ever hear. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Jay. Have a good one. Okay. Uh, good. To Well, that was it. Jay Rosenstein. That was a heck of an interview. In my opinion, I, I really enjoyed my conversation with him. He is an extraordinary individual who really stuck his neck out to tell a story that wasn't being told, which is Charlene's story, the story of Native representation as, a, as it pertains to mascots. And I thought that was a wonderful thing that he was really able to put his his potential career on the line because he was like, this is an important story that I need to tell and we'll deal with the ramifications, the consequences as they come. But I think this is a good opportunity for me to tell her story and expand her uh, really reach with this message. And he did a fantastic job. You know, even though I saw this as a junior in high school and this film is now 23 years old, it still resonates. It's still relevant with all of the happenings that we have going on right now. And it, it, ha it has manifested in helping with some of the landmarks that we have now with uh, the Washington Redskins now being put to bed. And now the Cleveland Indians will be next. And, you know, we still have the, some of the more prominent ones out there. And I think uh, obviously the next level would be the high schools. And that'll be an interesting next step to tackle and delve into with uh, Indian country. But you know what? The conversation is at a level that it's never been at before, and we're, it's more acceptable now to talk about this in a negative way, to say, like, hey, representation in mascots is not okay. Native representation is not okay in the, in the fashion that we have come to portray natives in with uh, 
with with sports. So it's it's we're in a, we're in a much better place because of this documentary, because of Charlene Teeters and what she did and continues to do, and actions by people like Amanda Blackhorse and Jay Rosenstein. So it was a great conversation. Um, I still don't agree with him I, that you know he said that he didn't want to make if it were today he wouldn't make this today because it's not an indigenous person telling the story. I th- you know I think I'm gonna go back and forth on this issue as the pro- as the podcast progresses but you know indigenous people don't need to tell a story um i think it certainly helps because our heart is in the right place and most times we're going to tell the right story but it really just needs to be handled with care and if the story even if you're an indigenous person you're a navajo person trying to help somebody maybe from uh cree nation and you're trying to help them tell their story you just need to let them tell their story just because you're indigenous doesn't mean that you are uh, you're going to get it right. I mean, even if you're a Cree person telling a Cree story, you're telling somebody else's story, chances are. So I think just having that care and ability to say, how did the person who wrote this story or experienced this, or even if it's fictional, how would these people want to be represented on screen? How would they uh, want their story to be told in the most truthful and accurate way possible? I think that's the most prudent way to proceed. And I'm excited to see where things go, but I hope that people like Jay Rosenstein continue to come forward. And of course, I want more people like Charlene Teeters in this world and continue to fight and push for what's right instead of thinking, uh, I don't know, it sounds kind of bad, but thinking about the consequences afterwards. But those people that just rush into the fire because they have a call to action, you know, those are the people that, uh, those are special individuals. And I think we all have that in us in some, to some degree. So. All right, everyone, we'll be back next week with uh, Thunderheart. Talk to you later. Have a good one.